Lucius Martius Septimius, legate in Spain, circa 218 to 206 BCE. Martius, a Roman legate who most likely never attained a single public office, was crucial to Rome's success over Carthage in Spain. Despite his obscurity and his lack of political reward, one can plausibly argue that Martius's actions in 212 to 211 constitute the most important single sequence in the Second Punic War. During this time, he managed to rally Roman Spain, gathering together all of the survivors of the armies of the Scipio brothers into a small but determined force. With this army, he managed to save Roman Spain, break the momentum that Hasdrubal had won during the battles of the Upper Bitus, and he ultimately bought time for Scipio Africanus to arrive with reinforcements in order to finish the job that his father and uncle had started. Scipio Africanus then retained Martius' services and employed him quite extensively during his conquest of Barsid Spain over the next four years. Despite his lack of official standing and the lack of recognition from the Roman Senate, Lucius Martius Septimius stands as one of the greatest heroes of the Second Punic War. In studying Martius, we run across a source problem from the outset. The only historian who mentions Martius, at least among the surviving corpus, is Livy. In the past, I've noted how Livy is sometimes rather unreliable and tends to, at best, embellish things. In this case, however, I think that we can trust Livy. When he's discussing Martius, he does cite multiple sources, one or two of them by name, and he makes it very clear that the story of Martius was quite well known and that the educated Romans of his time had already read about Martius and his deeds in other histories. Because of that, I'm inclined to think that Livy at least got the basics right, even if he might have embellished here or there as he was wont to do. That being said, another thing to keep in mind is that just because he's only mentioned in Livy does not necessarily mean that he did not exist or was not important. We have to remember that Martius was not all that well connected compared to most of the other generals we've talked about who were from the Second Punic War. He does not seem to have had any real descendants who had power, so Polybius, for instance, would have had no real reason to write about Martius, not to mention that we're missing huge sections of Polybius' work to begin with. A lot of what we do and do not have in ancient history comes down to a matter of simple survival, and I imagine that is really what the problem is here rather than, say, Livy got a little too creative for his own good. So, I think that we can trust Livy on this matter, even if we should be a little cautious of a few of the details, but hopefully I've done that in this video. In contrast to every other famous Roman you can name from the Second Punic War, Martius was not born into a senatorial family. His ancestors had never held any public office in Rome. We don't know for sure if he was from Rome proper, or from one of Rome's colonies, or even one of Rome's loyal allies. What we do know is that his father was a member of the Equestrian Order, and his name was Septimus Martius. If he had earned the last name Septimius, it would have been rather repetitive, so hopefully he did not. It's worth noting that in the Middle Republic, there was a definite wealth gap between senators and equestrians. In the Late Republic, which is what most people are familiar with, it was more of a status gap, and sometimes the wealth of an equestrian could be on par with the senator. In this period, however, there was still a definite hierarchy of estates, so Martius would not have been as wealthy by as someone like Scipio, and it was not particularly close. That being said, we should not make the mistake of thinking that he was poor or humble. Martius most likely never had to worry about where money was coming from at any point in his life, and he also never had to work for a living. He was just as leisured as his senatorial peers, even if he had fewer slaves doing tasks for him. Martius, however, while his family did not have the economic means to support a political career, still seems to have entertained political ambitions. It is not known whether or not he ever achieved that dream, but my guess is that he did not. 
The Marcii as a whole may very well have been allies or supporters of the patrician Scipio family, although it is also equally possible that Martius was assigned for his military service to the army of Scipio Calvus, and that the relationship between the two of them was a new development which was created by the contingencies of the campaign starting in 218. Martius only emerges onto the historical stage in Book 25 of Livy. This is in the immediate aftermath of the catastrophe at the Battles of the Upper Bitus, where Hasdrubal Mago and Hasdrubal Gizgo managed to almost completely wipe out the two armies of the Scipio brothers. The survivors of the two Roman armies and the garrisons that they left behind north of the Ebro are now scrambling to try to defend their foothold in Spain. And it is into the void of leadership that we see Lucius Martius Septimius emerge. According to Livy, Martius had been Scipio Calvus's chief legate and had learned quite a bit about war from him. Livy was a big fan of Scipio Calvus, as we have discussed, and thought that Martius inherited most of the bald Scipio's military abilities. It would appear that if he was that senior, he had been left in charge of Roman Spain north of the Ebro during the 212 campaign while the two Scipio brothers were campaigning in the south with the main forces. Tiberius Fontius, who was Publius Scipio's primary legate, had survived the battle where Publius had died and had led the survivors back into Roman Spain. Scipio Calvus's field army had produced far fewer survivors because he was pursued directly by Massinissa and the Numidian cavalry. When all of the forces, the survivors of Fontius and the garrisons of the north got together, the men voted on a new commander, and the man who was chosen unanimously was Martius. And Livy then goes on to explain why in a fairly memorable passage. In Book 25, Chapter 37, Livy decides that it would be a good idea to explain who Martius was and why the men were so taken by him as to elect him unanimously. His description, I think, answers the question quite well. Quote, he was a dynamic young man whose courage and intelligence were considerably greater than one might expect from the station in which he was born. To complement his natural qualities, he had also the advantages of Gnaeus Scipio's training, which had, over the course of many years, given him a thorough education in the whole range of military service. What's odd is that Livy says that no one really expected him to be very good because of his relatively low birth. What's a little bit ironic is that Livy himself was a member of the equestrian order, but perhaps on some level he had internalized a lot of the biases of the people he was writing for, including the Emperor Augustus, who of course was a patrician. I don't know, it's rather odd. That being said, whatever it was about Martius, the man clearly had some degree of magnetism and the men looked to him in a crisis. It would turn out that their faith was very well placed. When the men initially elected Martius to be their commander, they were elated to have a great leader and they went to work feverishly to prepare the defenses of their main camp. However, when they caught sight of Hasdrubal's army, which was vastly superior to their own, they really lost hope, became despondent, and began to lament the loss of the Scipio brothers. The degree of the loss really started to set in after the initial shock of the disasters at the Upper Bias had worn off. However, Martius went up to his men, chided them for the way that they were acting, and told them that they needed to focus on avenging their fallen commanders and comrades. This seemed to do the trick, and not only did the men rally to the colors, but they also were greatly inspired. As Livy pointed out earlier, Martius was a man with a great deal of charisma. Hasdrubal's men approached the camp expecting an easy win. They did not seem to have taken the Romans terribly seriously, and so they were shocked when the Romans came out with blood-curdling screams and slammed into them with unexpected force. It was not because they were overwhelmed by the Romans, just that they were taken off guard. 
but the Carthaginian force was broken by this attack. For Martius's part, he realized that although he had gained some momentum with this little action, that his force was not sufficiently large to fight and win a pitched battle with Hasdrubal's army, so he had to reel in the enthusiasm of his men, and this required him to dash ahead of his advanced elements and overtake a standard bearer and make sure that the men returned to camp before they went off on a pursuit that they couldn't possibly finish. Although Martius's minor victory was impressive and did a great deal to restore Roman morale, it was ultimately more symbolic than substantive. Martius had not managed to alter the balance of power or the strategic situation in any way. He was still greatly outnumbered by Hasdrubal Barca's army. Hasdrubal, for his part, according to Livy, was a bit overconfident and did not take Martius seriously. If Livy is correct to suspect that Mago Barca and Hasdrubal Gizgo were also marching to the north, then it should come as no surprise that Hasdrubal felt that way. He already had a fairly commanding advantage in numbers, and this advantage would only increase to truly insurmountable levels if his brother and the other Hasdrubal were to arrive. Martius also understood this and realized that his only chance was to act boldly. Although everything was on the line and Roman Spain was hanging by a thread, Martius knew that his only chance was to risk everything and hope for the best. His plan, in short, was to knock out Hasdrubal before the other two armies could arrive to save him. Even so, this plan was a long shot. Livy says that in every account that he has read of this event where Martius explains his plan to his men that there was a flame which seemed to arise from Martius's head and this is supposed to be a sign from the gods a sign of divine favor the Romans very much believed that the struggle between Rome and Carthage was an epic struggle and that ultimately they prevailed because of the favor of the gods this is a small but subtle way for Livy and the authors that he drew upon to convey that point. Martius, although he was a fairly insubstantial and minor figure, was the chosen instrument of the gods in order to deliver Rome to an ultimate victory. If one views Martius's plan from the Roman perspective, then it was divinely inspired. Martius decided to stake everything on a surprise attack. While it was dark, he marched his men around the flank of Hasdrubal's main camp and marched several miles to the rear. He then divided his force into two parts, placing one element between Hasdrubal's secondary camp and the main camp, which was several miles ahead. He then took the main force and struck at dawn. They achieved complete surprise at this secondary camp, which was several miles removed from where the Carthaginians thought that Martius and his men were located. It's not surprising that the Carthaginians there were not terribly ready, as, to the best of their knowledge, there was a main body of Carthaginian troops between themselves and the Romans. After the Carthaginians in the camp decided to bolt and flee in the direction of the main camp, they discovered that Martius had foreseen that possibility, and the troops he had put into ambush emerged and captured or killed all of the men who were trying to flee through the woods to the main force. The upshot of this decision by Martius is that none of the men in the main camp had any idea what had occurred. It was too far away to hear the screams of the dead and dying, and none of the men at the secondary camp were able to escape and, and form the main camp. By the time that he reached the main camp, Martius found that Hasdrubal's men were still eating breakfast, foraging, and generally going about their routine in a fairly lackadaisical manner. If there were any sentries posted, they were all facing the front, where they assumed that Martius's men were at. When they saw a force of men approaching from the south, they just assumed that these were friendlies. They didn't bother to report it to their commander. By the time they figured out what was going on, they figured out that they were in a bad position to try to resist the attack. 
when the Carthaginians noticed that Martius's men had blood on their swords and shields, they panicked and realized that their rear camp had been butchered. So, rather than trying to hold their camp bravely, they instead panicked and fled. This was, by any measure, a brilliant and inspired victory. Out of sheer desperation, Martius launched a daring attack on Hasdrubal's camp and managed to win a victory at some unknown and unnamed place. This is what gave him his renown in antiquity, and indeed the renown that got him into this series. However, we don't actually know that much about the battle's material quantitative significance, only its significance on the overall conduct of the war. Livy, who normally offers up numbers, including numbers which are sometimes pretty implausible, says that his sources vary too wildly in their estimates of Punic casualties for him to really make a guess. And if he himself sees these numbers as suspect, they must have been really far out there. Livy is not the kind of person who has a high barrier for what seems to be plausible. He mentions one of the historians he read named Valerius Antius, who wrote that there was only one camp that Martius stormed, and that the camp was under the command of Mago Barca and not Hasdrubal Barca. We can see, therefore, that there was some disagreement in the accounts of the Second Punic War about just who Martius faced and exactly what he did, but Livy is adamant that all of the sources agree that Martius performed extremely well, and also that the flame incident was real. After this unnamed battle, Hasdrubal, or whoever was the commander of the Carthaginian forces, seems to have withdrawn back across the Ebro, and both sides remained inactive for a while. This break was entirely to the benefit of Rome. Sure, the Carthaginian force might have become demoralized by this victory, but there is not really that high of a chance that the army itself was destroyed or maimed severely simply because the Roman force was most likely tiny. And this kind of a pause was entirely to the benefit of Rome and Rome alone. In the interval, there were reinforcements first from the pro praetor Gaius Claudius Nero and then ultimately from Scipio Africanus. This was a major turning point in the war as the one great victory that Hasdrubal was finally able to produce after years of frustration was blown because of the intervention of a completely unknown legate. By 212, the overall momentum of the war was beginning to favor Rome. They were about to retake Capua. The First Macedonian War had failed to really hurt Rome, and they had managed to contain that and mostly get the Aetolians to fight the war for them. And Carthage's ally, Syracuse, was on the verge of collapse. However, the battles of the Upper Bitus would have been very bitter news indeed, as this created the potentially catastrophic scenario where Hasdrubal Barca led another major army into Italy to reinforce Hannibal, and now Hannibal would have the critical mass needed to really press forward his campaign. So, you might think that the Senate would be celebrating and dancing in the streets when they learned about Martius' achievement, how he had saved Rome's foothold to fight another day, and prevented Hasdrubal from marching through his territory and potentially getting into Italy. The reason why the Senate was upset was somewhat procedural. One, Martius had styled himself as a pro praetor. This was a man who was a member of the equestrian order, he had never been elected to a single public office, and now he was assuming Rome's second highest command magistracy and doing so because he had been elected by his men. That part the Senate liked even less. The Senate was adamant that they should determine who the commanders were. The Senate during this time was a little more flexible than normal when it came to recognizing the norms and niceties of politics, but this for them was a step too far. And it kind of makes sense because by this point they had convinced themselves that only they 
could select successful commanders. If they left it up to chance or whatever man's turn it was based on his age and popularity, then they were just asking for disaster. So they wanted to make sure that they retained command over who got to command armies. The Senate therefore decided to snub Martius and did so in a pretty cold way, which more or less made light of his considerable achievement. In their reply to Martius, they do acknowledge him as the commander, but they do not give him a title, whether that title be pro or anything else. The Senate also decided that they needed to make sure that they appointed a commander to make sure that Martius did not retain command. So they immediately dispatched the pro-praetor Gaius Claudius Nero, who had a small army in Italy, and put him in charge in Spain. Later on, when they were looking for a permanent replacement for the Scipio brothers, they proved to be quite flexible. Young Scipio Africanus made a bid, even though he had only served as keister and edile up to that point, based on his familial connections with many of the leaders of the uh, Celtiberian tribes. So the Senate was very flexible when it came to appointing a 25-year-old Scipio Africanus, but Martius, who had been selected by his men and clearly had a lot of purchase with those men, was a step too far. And, to add further insult to injury, since he was not a magistrate, Martius was ineligible for a triumph or ovation. You had to be either a praetor or a consul to earn one of those honors. So no matter how great the victory, and no matter how many foreign foes were slain, Martius could not have possibly earned one of those honors. And I don't know for sure, but I think this might have actually come as something of a surprise to him. Perhaps he thought that given the gravity of the situation and the degree of his triumph that he would be rewarded with Senate membership and a celebration, but this was not to be. Although the Senate as a whole was not particularly interested in Martius or his achievements, the newly arrived Scipio Africanus very much was. One of his first acts when he arrived and replaced Nero was to request that Martius remain in Spain as a legate. This was not some sort of symbolic appointment to win the favor of the men or show that he was continuing where his father and uncle had left off, however, as Martius would continue to be one of the major commanders in Scipio's army. Livy says that by retaining Martius, Scipio was also signaling that he was not worried about being upstaged by someone without a lot of status, but who clearly had an immense amount of skill. So this is how Scipio established his confidence and basic competence with his men, at least according to Livy. Martius was a great pickup for any commander in Spain, as he not only had a great deal of standing with the men who worshipped the ground that he walked on, but he also had a great deal of local knowledge. He was the guy Scipio could turn to to learn about past campaigns and his father and uncle's dealings with the various leaders around Spain. No doubt Scipio made great use of Martius as an advisor as well as a field commander. And over the next four years Martius would be one of a few different men whom Scipio entrusted with important tasks repeatedly. Just like all of Scipio's other subordinates, Martius invariably delivered. Over the next four years, Martius was very busy doing things on Scipio's behalf, and whether he was serving as a subordinate or in an independent capacity, he always got the job done. At the Battle of Baikula in 208, he was a subordinate under Silanus on the left wing. This, of course, was the great victory that Scipio won over Hasdrubal Barca, which forced him to vacate Spain, ultimately marching to Italy to meet his fate at the hands of Livius Salinator and Claudius Nero. When Scipio and Laelius traveled to Africa in order to meet with Syphax of the Numidians, Martius was left behind at Terraco in order to govern the north while Silanus held down the fort in Spain south of the Ebro. During the revolt of the Ilaturgi and the city of Castulo, Martius took one-third of the army, 
and set out to deal with Castillo while Scipio dealt with the rebels in the field. Scipio then arrived with the rest of the army to complete the siege, and the battle was ultimately decided when the Celtiberian chief, Cerdubalus, decided to betray Himilco and the Carthaginian garrison. There's a good chance, at least I think, that given all of his local connections, that Martius was the one who initiated the discussions with Cerdubalus and ultimately set up the betrayal that Scipio was able to bring to fruition. After the siege of Castula was completed, Martius took his forces and marched on to Astapa, which was another city in revolt. This, however, would not be your average siege. The locals at Astapa had always been loyal to Carthage, and for whatever reason, perhaps because they didn't think the Romans would grant them clemency, they decided to forge a suicide pact. While some of the men were holding off the Romans at the walls, other men were busy butchering the women and children and throwing them onto the funeral pyres. By the time that the Romans broke through the enemy defenses, it was too late, and the whole city had burned to the ground. The burning of the city was so thorough that the Romans were deprived of any kind of plunder. The Romans by this point were quite battle-hardened and always had a certain bloodthirstiness, but even for them, the sight of seeing men kill their own families and then throw themselves on the funeral pyres was a bit much. Nonetheless, despite the scarring things that the Romans experienced, the fate of Astapa was something that was sufficiently horrifying that the other cities in revolt decided to surrender to Martius, and he was then able to return to Scipio at Carthago Nova. In 206, after the Battle of Illipa and during the revolt of the Celtiberian chiefs in Dibilus and Mandonius, Mago Barca, the Carthaginian commander-in-chief of Barsid, Spain, dispatched one of his generals named Hanno to the north to recruit more men. Most likely, Hanno was recruiting among the Lusitanians, who lived in what is today southern Portugal. When Scipio learned of Hanno's recruitment efforts, he feared that the Carthaginians would use their monetary reserves to rebuild an army, and he would have to fight another major battle in order to keep the Carthaginians at bay. He decided that it was best to nip this in the bud, so he dispatched the general Martius with several thousand men to deal with the threat. According to Livy, both armies were about evenly matched in terms of numbers. Each one had around five to 7,000 men, and so numerically they were pretty much on par in both infantry and cavalry. The difference, of course, is that while Hanno did have a small corps of Africans, most of his army were recent recruits, and they had not yet really banded together or formed any kind of cohesion. The battle was a complete one-sided ass-kicking. Martius was able to crush Hanno's army, destroying most of his small African corps, scattering the new recruits to the winds, and taking Hanno captive. While it was not the most important or amazing victory, the Battle of the River Bitus was yet another feather in the cap of the already accomplished Martius. After the suppression of the revolt of Indibilis and Mandonius, Scipio and Martius were both residing in further Spain, or as the Romans called it, Hispania Ulterior. The exact boundaries of this province are not entirely clear, and I highly suspect that this map reflects a later disposition, as at that time the Romans sort of thought of the extreme northeast corner as the Roman foothold, and the rest of it as Barsid Spain. It's unlikely that they had drawn borders like this at this point. The north, the safe part, was under the command of the proprietor Silanus. Martius and Scipio both engaged in some light operations around this time, but for the most part, Scipio's attention was focused on his upcoming consulship and making preparations for his campaign to Africa in order to finish the war. During this time, Masinissa had basically lost his power in Numidia and he was still serving Carthage in a minor capacity, raiding some of the Celtiberians aligned with Rome. However, he was awed by Scipio, and he was also aware that he was going to require some outside aid if he ever wanted to come back into power in Numidia 
and gain his revenge on Syphax, who had taken advantage of the civil war that he was fighting with his brother in order to effectively eliminate his standing. Masinissa, therefore, wanted to meet with Scipio, and the first Roman that he came into contact with was none other than the governor, Martius. While Martius and Masinissa awaited the arrival of Scipio, the two of them chatted, and so, in a way, although Martius was not an officially de uh, dedicated diplomat, he was the first Roman to really sit down with Masinissa and establish some kind of rapport. Ultimately, of course, it was the charming and suave Scipio who won the man over to the cause and ultimately helped to make sure that the Romans and Numidians would become allies, which became a key element in the ultimate Roman victory over Hannibal in North Africa. After this point, the year 206, we hear nothing further of Lucius Martius Septimius, and the historian Appian makes it clear that both Martius and Silanus were relieved in favor of two men named Lentulus and Manlius. Put simply, Lucius Martius Septimius was a man of extraordinary significance for the outcome of the Second Punic War, and yet he had an extraordinarily limited legacy. Early historians of the war, including all of the individuals whom Livy read, recognized that Martius was an important figure and that his contributions had been key to Rome's ultimate success. Livy also claims that the Carthaginians were well aware of how good Martius was and how key his actions were to depriving Hasdrubal of a chance to win in Spain. Supposedly, they would say that Martius was the guy who cost them the Spanish theater when all was said and done. If you've ever played a game of Total War and a stack of men with no known leader wins a huge battle and then your faction adopts some guy with excellent stats, you experience the Martius moment. If you've ever played a board game where you see a stack of leaderless men who are outnumbered defeating a larger stack under a decent leader, then you also have experienced a Martius moment. What's really interesting about Martius is that to the best of my knowledge, he was someone who was never on the losing side of a battle, whether he was operating as a subordinate general or in an independent capacity. Whether he was laying siege, keeping the peace in the countryside, or fighting a pitched battle, Martius was someone who was consistently successful and clearly understood the whole art of war, as Livy said in his description of Martius. Later in life, after he returned to Rome, we know that Martius was still alive because he decided to commission a shield with Hasdrubal's portrait in order to commemorate his great victory back in 212 or 211. He then dedicated this shield at the Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus to keep the memory alive. Apparently, this was still something that people remembered right up until the temple caught fire and the shield was destroyed. Although the Senate never officially, to the best of my knowledge, recognized Martius' achievements, they were well known and historians of the war recognized those achievements. In more recent times, Martius has been consigned to obscurity. This is because his name does not appear in Polybius' history and many professional historians do not take Livy seriously enough to give credence to anything that he has to say which is not corroborated by Polybius. That is extraordinarily limiting given, given how little of Polybius we actually have compared to how much Polybius wrote. I think, as I said earlier, that we can trust Livy to a decent extent in regards to the historicity and deeds of Martius. When it comes to his legacy, Martius has no known descendants, and it is not entirely clear if he ever was successful entering the Senate at any level. We know from the Fosti that he definitely did not make consul if he did enter the Senate. We also know from the broader context of the time that any known allies of Scipio Africanus were very much attacked and held back by Cato the Elder and the more conservative faction in the Senate. So if Martius did enter politics, he most likely met with frustration, roadblocks, and defeat. So far as I can tell, he was every bit as unsuccessful in politics as he was successful on the battlefield. 
And if it was in proportion, then this means that he might have been the worst politician ever. Because Martius was, as we have seen, an incredibly talented, low-level general. Until next time, I am Thersites the Historian, and I will return in the future with more Romans of renown, hopefully men who are quite interesting even if they are a bit obscure.